One of the most difficult things to troubleshoot in watchmaking is a watch that is losing time because the vast majority of issues cause the rate to increase. So today, we're going to troubleshoot a movement that is losing over 1,200 seconds per day, and it's not going to be as difficult as you may think. The movement we have today is a Waltham grade 625 that actually belongs to a friend of mine, David, who lives in one of my favorite parts of the country, Lexington, Kentucky. David is a relatively new home watchmaker, and he was working on this movement, and it was just giving him all kinds of fits, and we were emailing back and forth trying to figure out what was going on with this thing. And then we finally decided that if he could send it out to me, I'd be glad to take a look at it. So here it is. Let's go ahead and put this movement on the timer and see what it looks like. Okay, so right away we can see that the loss is massive. Our means rate or our average rate is negative 1,064. So that is telling us that this is a major hairspring problem. So let's go ahead and remove the balance so we can take a closer look at it. Typically when a watch is losing time, it could be something as simple as the regulator being too close to the hairspring stud. It could be a loose impulse jewel or the regulator pins are open too much. But when you have a movement running this slow, the fault is going to be located somewhere on the balance complete. One of the challenges when working on these old movements is that you can never assume that the movement is correct. It's guaranteed to have been serviced at least two or three times over its lifetime. And without knowing its service history, combined with the fact that it was bought on eBay, just adds a whole nother level of uncertainty to its originality. Who knows the skill or knowledge level of the people who have worked on it before? All right, now we have the balance out of the watch. Let's take a closer look. Well, the first issue that we can see is that the timing screws have literally been screwed out about as far as they can go. So the first thing we need to do is bring those timing screws back closer to the balance wheel and see how that affects the rate. Is that going to correct a negative 1,000 seconds per day? Probably not, but we need to start somewhere. Now, just in case you're not familiar with a screwed balance, let me give you a broad overview. There are two types of screws that you'll find on the rim of a bimetallic balance wheel. Timing screws and mass screws. Now, timing screws can be identified by their long thread, and they're used solely to adjust positional rates. And you should not see timing washers under the timing screws. Sometimes there are two, and sometimes there are going to be four of them. When there are four timing screws, they're usually referred to as quarter screws, because each one represents a quarter of the balance wheel. Mass screws are primarily there for making temperature compensation adjustments on bimetallic balance wheels, but they can also be used to adjust positional rates either by removing weight from the screw or by adding timing washers under the screw. And unlike timing screws, mass screws should always be tight to the balance rim. And I think it's also important to note that if you do adjust the mass screws for positional rates, that'll throw off their adjustments for temperature compensation. So, the bottom line here is that you can't have both unless you want to go back and statically repoise the balance first. While temperature compensation might be important in some timepieces, like let's say you're adjusting a marine chronometer, for example, for most pocket watches, temperature compensation doesn't really matter so much. 
Pocket watches are carried close to the body, so most people don't really care about it that much. Well, as you can see, returning the timing screws to the balance wheel made a little bit of a difference, but we're still way off. Our average rate sped up from negative 1064 to negative 938, so that's an improvement of 126 seconds per day. But when your timing is off this far, it's always going to come down to a bad hairspring. Now, there are several issues with hairsprings that can cause a slow rate. Rust is a major one. Rust actually breaks down the elasticity of the spring, weakening it, so it's no longer strong enough to rotate the balance. Even a hairspring that's been manipulated too much can lose some of its springiness, again, creating the same kind of fault. So, what do we have here? Well, the condition of the hairspring looks pretty good. There's a little bit of rust, so it's not in perfect condition, but for a watch this age, it still looks pretty good. Well, the balance spring could be the wrong weight, so it doesn't match to this balance wheel, but that probably wouldn't result in a negative 900 rate. So it probably comes down to there's either a problem with the terminal curve or this is the wrong hairspring altogether. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what the hairspring should look like. The terminal curve on a Breguet hairspring is based on a percentage between the radius of the center of the regulator pins and the radius of the hairspring. To figure it out, we first measure from the center of the upper pivot hole to the center of the regulator pins, which in this case is 3.08 millimeters. Then we measure from the center of the collet to the outside of the hairspring, which is 4.42 millimeters. Then we divide the radius of the pins by the hairspring radius, and then we multiply that by 100, and we get 72.98. That's our percentage. I can already hear some of you asking me, how accurate does this measurement need to be? Well, it needs to be close, but we're not going to get it exact with the type of measuring tools that we have access to. So... You just have to get it as close as you can. Now, with our ratio for this balance cot figured out, we can check the Helwig chart to see what the hairspring should look like. These numbers on the chart are not just random numbers. These are the actual ratios of that hairspring. Now, our ratio is 72.98. So all we need to do is just round down to the next ratio, which in our case is 72.5. Ironically, the hardest part of this entire process is reducing the chart down to the right size so that it's to scale and correct for the hairspring. When you look at the chart, you'll notice that there are two drawings. The one on the left is for a right-handed hairspring, and the one on the right is for a left-handed hairspring. On a left-handed hairspring, it comes out of the collet and spirals counterclockwise, and a right-handed hairspring comes out of the collet and spirals clockwise. On this hairspring, it comes out of the collet and spirals counterclockwise, so we're going to use the drawing on the right. On the drawing, you'll see the location for the hairspring count point or pinning point, which is the point that actually sits between the regulator pins. Okay, so when we lay our hairspring on the drawing, we're looking for a couple of different things. The first is the point where the hairspring is raised, which is right here. This is where it begins to curve up. And the second is the breakaway point. Now, the breakaway point is the second bend in the spring where it actually levels out again. 
and our curve starts just beyond that point. If we lay the hairspring on the drawing, we can see that the breakaway point where the curve should be starting is way up here. And if we were to bend this hairspring down and get it to follow this curve, the hairspring stud would end up way somewhere out here. And since our hairspring stud should be at this point on the drawing, what that's telling me is that this hairspring is too long and that is why I believe that we have such a slow rate. So if this hairspring is not a 7.25 ratio, well, what is it? Now, if you move over to the 8.5 ratio, now you can see that the breakaway point is correct here. The hairspring stud is correct. And the curve is almost exact to the drawing. So now we know that the hairspring is wrong and we can actually file this hairspring away as an 8-5 ratio. And we also know that because the ratio is based on the balance cock itself, this spring never belonged to this balance wheel. Okay, so I've sourced a new hairspring that should work. But as you can see, there's been some very sloppy shellac work. And we have shellac that's in between the coils of the hairspring here by the collet. And when you look on the other side, you can see that we also have shellac on the underside of the collet. So we're going to need to remove that first before we can test this hairspring to make sure it works. Otherwise, all this shellac is going to not only mess up the poise of the balance wheel, but it's going to cause us some problems with timing this watch later on. To clean the hairspring, I've just soaked it in some denatured alcohol. I like to use the denatured alcohol because it's a little bit hotter than IPA, so it works a little bit faster. Now I'm just using a soft artist brush to clean off some of the spots where shellac was stuck to the springs. And now we'll just dry the spring with my battery operated blower. Now I can go ahead and stake the hairspring onto the balance wheel. To install the balance back to the balance cock, I like to put the balance wheel in position and then lay the balance cock on top of it and secure it down with its screw. Now we can install the hairspring in position. Level the hairspring to the top of the balance cock and screw it down. Now we're going to give it a full wind so that we can get it back on to the time grapher and see what it looks like. Well, this time graph reading is 
definitely a move in the right direction. Other than crown left, which is negative 539, everything else is in a manageable place. And you'll notice that now we have some fast rates and we've got some slow rates in there. So the Waltham 625 is only adjusted to three positions. So that'd be dial up, dial down, and crown up. So in our next video, I'm going to disassemble, inspect, and adjust this watch to get it back within factory specs. So if you're interested in this kind of thing and you haven't subscribed, what the heck are you waiting for? Today, you've just seen a glimpse of what my complete watch repair course has to offer. From mastering the basics to tackling complex repairs like this one, I'm there to guide you every step of the way. If you're ready to turn your passion for watches into a rewarding skill, then check out the link in the description for more information.